Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today's topic is a highly requested one. We're going to take a look at a moment in English history that is often credited with being the very foundation of a north-south divide on these islands. This division continues to make the news as social, cultural and economic differences between the south and the north remain apparent and some would even argue ever expanding. It's time for us to explore the period between the end of 1069 and the start of 1070 to look at the event that history remembers as the harrying of the north. Hopping back, 1066 is arguably one of the most famous years in all of English history. It is, after all, the year of the conquest. The year that William, Duke of Normandy, became William the Conqueror through the defeat of Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. And while, as we know now, this defeat would represent a key shift in the governance of England, for those living at the time, the foundation and furthering of Norman rule was by no means a foregone conclusion. I have made a video on the events of 1066, including the, shall we say, kerfuffle that occurred during William's coronation at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066. At this time, the cheers of assent from William's newly conquered subjects panicked his Norman soldiers into thinking that a violent revolt was afoot, with the result being that these Norman soldiers then began to burn the surrounding buildings. This, in turn, led to rioting. I will leave that video linked so you can go and check it out if you wish. Today, however, we're going to be exploring the continuing unrest in England, the Norman anxiety over how they could hold power and the aggression that ultimately resulted from it. William spent much of 1067 on progress around Normandy. He was accompanied by a selection of significant figures from the nation he had conquered in the previous year. Included in this group was Edgar Aethling. He was the teenage great-nephew of King Edward the Confessor. And for a brief couple of months, following the death of Harold Godwinson, Edgar was William's rival to be King of England, having been named as such by the Witten Council. However, at the start of December 1066, Edgar would submit to William and pay him homage. One of Edward the Confessor's advisers, Stigand, the Archbishop of Canterbury, joined this party on their journey around Normandy, as did some of the more prominent earls from England. William's decision at this fairly early stage to return to Normandy for a number of months, beginning in March 1067, was arguably evidence of his sense of security in his power and control over his new dominions. Or perhaps it was, in fact, a sign of his desire to appear to feel secure. The choice of his companions, I think, arguably functions in a similar way. It's either a display of submission and unity, a victory lap, if you will, for the conquering William, and or it's a way for that William to ensure a collection of potential troublemakers were kept well and truly occupied. Whatever William may have believed or indeed hoped, unrest did begin to bubble up in England during his absence. William returned to England in the December of 1067. At the start of the next year, he set out to pacify the South East by, among other things, successfully besieging Exeter. With this achievement, William felt it was time for his wife Matilda to be introduced to his new subjects and to be recognised as their queen. Her coronation took place at Westminster Abbey on Whit Sunday, the 11th of May, 1068. Any comfort, any security that William may have felt at this point would be very short-lived. Before long, the Earls Edwine and Morcar, who were two members of that party that had joined William in Normandy in 1067, rose up against him. 
Edwine was reportedly embittered by a lack of real authority over his land. And then on top of this, it was alleged that William had reneged on a promise to allow Edwine to marry one of his daughters. There was support for this uprising coming out of Wales. Then, people in northern England took advantage of this growing chaos with their own rising. Adding to this threat to William's authority was Edgar Aisling's flight from William's court to that of Malcolm, King of Scots. In response, William marched through the Midlands and on to York. On the way there and back, William made changes. He ensured, for example, that he now placed his numerous castles in the hands of those that he could trust implicitly, namely his fellow Normans. This strategy proved successful. These threats were sufficiently quelled for William and Matilda to feel confident enough to depart from England in order to spend the end of 1068 and the start of 1069 back in Normandy. William was, however, drawn back to England by assaults that were launched on York and Durham that were led by Edgar Aisling. At this time, William was able to force his enemies into retreat near York. The danger was, however, only ramping up. Sven Estrithen, King of Denmark, arrived in the north of England with a large army at his back in the summer of 1069. His forces had the support of Edgar Aisling and also many of Edgar's fellow rebels. It appears that Edgar and those who had fought for him were now willing to forego his claim to be the English king in favour of that of Sven. And perhaps this is understandable considering that there were likely cultural similarities between those living in northern England and these Danish invaders. As, after all, much of this area had been under Danish control during the late 9th and 10th centuries. Indeed, perhaps this contributed to this invading force and its allies being able to successfully capture York on September 20th, 1069. Despite this early success... William was able to first contain this invasion and then to push it back. Indeed, the Danish army would ultimately retreat out of England within just a few months. William, however victorious he was, does seem to have felt that he now had a score to settle with his northern subjects. And so, after celebrating Christmas in the battle-damaged York, William chose to lead his army through the country into Northumbria. It appears that this troop were permitted, if not in fact actively encouraged, to leave nothing but destruction in their wake. This period, this series of events, is what history remembers as the harrowing of the North. Various chronicles offer a frankly incredibly disturbing account of this harrying and its effects. I've chosen a couple and I'm going to share some excerpts from those now. As I said, these accounts are disturbing, so if this is not something you want to hear, then I'm going to leave a timestamp to let you know when to skip to, to avoid listening to it. I'm going to jump in now. Simeon of Durham was born around six years before the conquest. He became a monk at Durham Priory, and he wrote his account of the harrying a few decades after it occurred. He is seemingly indebted to another chronicler, John of Worcester, whose report he builds upon. Simeon wrote that following William's march into Northumbria, quote, so great a famine prevailed that men, compelled by hunger, devoured human flesh, that of horses, dogs and cats, and whatever custom abhors. Others sold themselves into perpetual slavery so that they might, in any way, preserve their wretched existence. Others while about to go into exile from their country, fell down in the middle of their journey and gave up the ghost. It was horrific to behold the human corpses decaying in the houses, the streets and the roads, swarming with worms, while they were consuming in corruption with an abominable stench. For no one was left to bury them in the earth, all being cut off either by the sword or by famine, or having left the country on account of famine. Meanwhile, the land, being thus deprived of anyone to cultivate it for nine years, an extensive solitude prevailed all around. There was no village inhabited between York and Durham. They became lurking places to wild beasts and robbers, and were a great dread to travellers. In a similar vein, 
Odric Vitalis wrote how, quote, numbers of the insurgents fell beneath his vengeful sword, meaning William's vengeful sword here. He levelled their places of shelter to the ground, wasted their lands and burnt their dwellings with all they contained. Never did William commit so much cruelty. To his lasting disgrace, he yielded to his worst impulse and set no bounds to his fury, condemning the innocent and the guilty to a common fate. In the fullness of his wrath, he ordered the corn and cattle, with the implements of husbandry and every sort of provisions, to be collected in heaps and set on fire till the whole was consumed, and thus destroyed at once all that could serve for the support of life in the whole country lying beyond the Humber. There followed, consequently, so great a scarcity in England in the ensuing years, and severe famine involved the innocent and unarmed population in so much misery that in a Christian nation more than a hundred thousand souls of both sexes and all ages perished of want. On many occasions in the course of the present history, I have been free to extol William according to his merits, but I dare not commend him for an act which levelled both the bad and the good together in one common ruin, by the infliction of a consuming famine. For when I see that innocent children, youths in the prime of their age, and grey-headed old men perish from hunger, I am more disposed to pity the sorrows and sufferings of the wretched people than to undertake the screening of one who was guilty of such wholesale massacre by lying flatteries. I assert, moreover, that such barbarous homicide could not pass unpunished. The Almighty Judge beholds alike the high and the low, scrutinising and punishing the acts of both with equal justice, that his eternal laws may be plain to all. Here, William is identified as the principal individual who should be held responsible for this incredible level of suffering that was inflicted on the people of the north of England many of whom, it was alleged, were non-combatants. The Harring of the North was, at least according to these reports, an atrocity, deserving of divine retribution. The violence of 1069 into 1070, for all that today it is credited with being the thing that finally brought England to heel under Norman rule, may in fact not actually have resulted in a decisive end to William's problems. Indeed, David Bates points out that it was only through the conclusion of the Peace of Abernathy with the King of Scots in 1072 that the, quote, succession of demanding campaigns could be seen to have gradually subdued England and the British Isles, that it would take more time, more action, both diplomatic and military, for it to be said that William had persuasively impressed his power on all his English and British enemies. So what do you think of the Harring of the North? Were you familiar with this particular event before today's video? And if so, how much did you know about it? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. I'd also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will help to boost the engagement. And the more engaged video gets, the more YouTube claims they share it out, and that should help to grow our community. As we've been talking about the Harring of the North, I think something medieval violency, maybe some swords, some crowns, some castles. You pick. I look forward to seeing what you choose. You can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do share it with your friends. And if you like my channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you are subscribed, now is an ideal time to check. You have not been mysteriously unsubscribed by YouTube against your will. While you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, YouTube allege they will tell you when I've next uploaded, but also when I'm next going to go live, which I do to talk about the history news. And I know you're not going to want to miss that. We have, of course, got our failsafe. 
head over to my website. I will link it. It's www.katrinamarchant.com. If you go to my contact page, you will find a little box. Put your email address in that box and then submit. And that will let me send you an email once a week. In that email, I will tell you what I've been up to. And I will also send you useful links for my content that you might want over the coming days. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.